Gigabyte's X299 motherboard lineup features a range of options with support for Intel's Core X series CPUs. Boards like the Aorus X299 Gaming 7 are packed with useful features and support Optane memory, Thunderbolt 3, and USB 3.1 Gen 2. Click the link in the description for more information. Excellent! Hey everyone, how's it going and welcome to Paul's Hardware. It is nearing the end of 2017 and today I actually have sort of a bunch of random stuff to do around here. So I thought at the same time I would ask you guys uh, via Twitter if you had any questions for me to end the year. So we've collected some of those. I'm going to be just sort of setting up uh, this system over here to, to ship out. I'm going to be taking this system over here apart and putting some stuff away and just trying to get tidied up and prepared for the next year. In the meantime though, Let's start with question number one. Do you have any plans for a home server built in 2018? All right, so this question is from Bob Roche uh, at CPU Kid on Twitter. And yes, actually. So earlier this year, is a, a four or five months ago, I went and I got this big old piece of walnut and been intending to wall mount that along with my HTPC. And a lot of people have asked about that and I haven't followed up with it several reasons contributing to that, but one of them is, I think I'm gonna make it more than just the HTPC. I think I'm gonna integrate server as part of, their, uh, part of that as well. So because that's kind of been evolving over time, I haven't gotten to it yet. But yes, I do plan to set up something akin to that in 2018, and uh, hopefully I have more details on that for you soon. When is the best time to purchase an electronics in its life cycle to maximize value and time? Example, getting a CPU immediately after launch versus waiting six months, thanks XD. Uh, this question's from Two Moon Studios uh, on Twitter, at Two Moon Studios, and it's a good question, and it probably varies based on the product that you're talking about. Um, CPUs, for instance, on the Intel side, if you look at the past, I don't know, five, ten years, don't tend to drop in price all that much. However, the AMD CPUs that they've come out with this year already did have some pretty significant uh, price discounts and everything, especially just in the past few weeks, going through holiday sales and Black Friday. So... I would say a couple months after initial launch is a good time period to wait to sort of see if anything bad might happen. For example, if you go all the way back to say when Sandy Bridge launched uh, P67 motherboards at the time uh, had an issue with the chipset and they had to issue a recall, uh, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Stuff like that will come out pretty early in the product's life cycle usually. Um, and then when it comes to discounts, um, usually brand new products aren't going to be discounted. Uh, if you give it a couple months, depending on how successful the product is, you may or may not actually see a discount at that point. So um, that's a little generic, but hopefully that helps you out a little bit. I'm interested in computers and I don't know what type of degrees I could get to work in the field. Thanks. All right, so this question's from Extra Large Chai or Bad Juju Gumbo on Twitter. And just asking about schooling when it comes to getting into computers. And um, first off, I guess I should point out, I did not go to school at all for anything computer related. I, I studied film and television. Uh, so you don't necessarily need that background, but it could help. Uh, computer science would be one that you should definitely investigate. Um, I would say definitely look into getting more familiar with software and programming. That is definitely an area that if I went back myself and wanted to re reassess what I was focusing on, I would spend more time on the software side of it. And then finally, if you're interested in the hardware side of it, uh, then engineering and specifically electrical engineering, uh, that's what your focus should be on there. What is the most expensive mistake you have ever made while assembling a computer? This question is from Christopher, Christopher at Milldog2010 on Twitter. And I've thought, of, I've actually been asked this question a few times somewhat recently, and I've had to think about it because I guess Whereas on the one hand you have Linus, who apparently drops and breaks things all the time. I don't know if I'm just more careful or more lucky, but I don't think I've really destroyed that much when it comes to computer parts. I will say that if I go back to my days at Newegg, and this may or may not be my fault, I, I cannot take full responsibility for this, but there was a 3960X engineering sample, which was a over $1,000 uh, CPU at the time and it died, um, and it may or may not have been due to ESD, uh, some electrostatic discharge, um, or it might not have been my fault at all. I wish I could give you more details, but I've been sworn to secrets, secrecy and silence by the others who were involved at the time. But definitely, 
killing a uh, very expensive high-end piece of computer hardware, especially a high-end graphics card or CPU. I'd say that that ranks right up there with it. Um, so that's my story. I wish I had more details on that. What is your most favorite case ever made? A good question. Um, all right, so we're gonna be working with a case later today, which you, the video may or may not be up for. Maybe that'll be a really good case, but I don't know. I'm speculating on that. All right, my Define R5 over there, which I modified for uh, Arctic Panther, I really like as a case just because it's a reasonable size. It's, it's not on right now or anything, so it's not looking like it. It's a reasonable size. I modified it and put tempered glass on, but it's not just like a piece of tempered glass. It's an actual steel side panel with a window cut out in it, which personally I like much better than just these tempered glass pieces by themselves. I also modified it to put a USB type C, uh, USB Gen 1, USB, USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C connector on there. So it's got all the modern connections and functionality that you'd want. The other case that pops into my mind uh, when you bring up that question is the Corsair 650D, which is a case that is a similar sort of box-like design to the Define R5 that Corsair came out with. And one of the reasons I really like that case is because it, in my mind, still has one of the best side panels as far as accessibility um, that, that has ever existed simply due to the fact that they, that they put two latches right here. So the side panel goes like that, two latches, it pops out a little bit and then you can just lift it off and away, which in my experience at the time, like if you had anything in front of the case, but you needed to get inside there, it was just a really good solution. I believe it had that on both sides as well. So it made access to the interior of the case very easily, very easy. Other than that, it was a well-designed case. At this point, it would be a little outdated. Uh, simply due to the, you know, probably it didn't have USB 3 and that kind of thing, but I really like the side panel design. It was just very functional and I also like the overall look of that one with the brush metal and everything. thought that was cool. Why do game developers are shading away from multi-GPU? Slide performance in Pascal is horrible, thanks. This question's from Lath Selman or Doc Lath on uh, Twitter and yeah, that's a good question because um, SLI, multi-GPU configurations, Crossfire uh, on the AMD side, although they don't call it Crossfire anymore. Um, they're sort of those drool-worthy high-end uh, configurations that a lot of people would look up to. And uh, the fact was though, and this is from talking to different industry reps, uh, some uh, NVIDIA folks and that kind of thing, actual people who have a two-way SLI or Crossfire setup with two graphics cards, let alone three or four-way, is very, very, very small. I don't have any actual stats for you, but I believe it was down in the like less than 2% range for SLI and then even much lower than that when it comes to three-way and four-way configurations. It also takes a significant amount of uh, research and development work and development of drivers, and especially development of drivers with different new games that might come out. So you're talking about a lot of uh, man hours and work on the back end, uh, for both the GPU manufacturer as well as software developers of the games. And at a certain point, they just realize, you know what? It's not practical to be investing this amount of time and effort into a configuration that is used so little and by so few people. So even though lots of people look at that kind of thing because it's the highest of the high end of what you can get, so few people are using it that they kind of stopped uh, even, even doing driver support for that. Now you can look at some benchmarking suites uh, that are specifically just made for benchmarking like 3 Mark, and those are still updated and those do still help driver support for multi-GPU configurations, but keeping up support for something like that that's a lot more contained and it's not a whole new game or anything like that is a lot easier for them than maintaining support for lots of different games. So that's pretty much what it comes down to. Money, investment of time, and also just the amount of people who are actually into it. So there's obviously uh, two sides to that and you might fall on one side or the other, whether you think it's it's a useful thing to keep up with in support of SLI or Crossfire configurations. But for now, it looks like two-way is uh, the max it's gonna be. Should I look at getting back into PC gaming or wait until cryptocurrency money stops gouging prices on GPUs? <sighs> okay, uh, Patrick Roseberry at Raging Iguana on YouTube. I'm sorry, on Twitter. I like your, I like your Twitter handle. Um, the... It's a difficult question because speculation has evolved and stuff and we don't really know exactly what's going to happen with cryptocurrency. I don't see cryptocurrency disappearing anytime soon by any stretch. The, the uh, validity of mining cryptocurrency with gaming GPUs also may or may not be something that stays popular. So 
for your purposes, I would look more at the RAM prices because the GPU prices have fluctuated. They've gone up and down. And if you follow the markets, uh, for example, you could get a Vega 56 or a Vega 64 for almost MSRP if you were following along in the past few weeks. Um, they, of course, went back up again, but they do dip. Uh, the overall price of memory, though, um, due to the NAND shortage, is crazy high. So that is anticipated potentially to start falling off as some production ramps up and some of the fabs in 2018. So I would keep an eye on that, maybe give a couple months into 2018 uh, to look at those prices. And then of course, l keep an eye on the GPU prices, but just bear in mind the volatility of cryptocurrency can also affect the volatility of GPU prices. And it's, uh, and if you can predict that sort of thing, you probably have a much better job prospects than I do coming up in the near future. Cause it's <laughs> never been anything that I've been interested in attempting. Hey Pa, I was wanting to do a liquid cooling build and I am unsure if I should liquid cool my 6700K and 1080 Ti. With the release of Coffee Lake, is it worth it to wait and buy Coffee Lake and a new mobile or should I just stick with what I have? So Jared, your question is about liquid cooling and should you water cool your 6700K and 1080 Ti? The way you're discussing this makes me think you're considering a full custom loop. Um, in which case, I hope that you have been saving money for that because a full custom loop is expensive and is not often the most you can get for your money when it comes to actual uh, PC performance. In your situation, if you really want the most you can get, you got a 1080 Ti, you're doing just fine with that for now. Yes, you could upgrade your 6700K uh, to Coffee Lake. Um, that would be a huge upgrade. And there's also a lot of stuff rumored to be happening in 2018. So I'd say you're pretty good for now with your hardware setup. When it comes to liquid cooling, if you're interested in setting up that custom loop, Bear in mind that the Intel sockets have maintained backwards compatibility when it comes to the uh, actual coolers for quite some time. So you could, for example, take a LGA 1150, 1151, 1156 CPU mount cooler and still use it, for example, with Coffee Lake. It might be a good time to start parting out some of your uh, custom loop and then you might also potentially have an upgrade path to still use like a CPU block that you get right now even next year when Intel comes out with whatever next gen stuff they're coming out with next year. All that said, just please bear in mind, custom liquid cooling loop is not the best bang for your buck when it comes to the amount of performance you get for your money. So just keep in mind, you're gonna spend probably between 400 and a thousand dollars on the cooling. And I would try to make sure that that stuff can be used for as long as possible. Which CPU generation do you feel was the most innovative and why? This question is from Randy Martin or at name brand Randy on Twitter and it's a little vague here, so I'm assuming you're talking about the entire lifespan of computers as it has ever since there were consumer computers out there. Um, there's probably lots of potential answers to this question, but I would actually go for uh, the stuff that AMD was working on back in 2005 and 2006 um, with their uh, original Athlon FX series of processors because they did some crazy innovative stuff back then that's Intel at the time had kind of said, you know, we don't need to do that stuff or anything. Uh, they, inter they integrated the memory controller onto the CPU uh, and they also introduced uh, dual core. They also introduced 64-bit uh, CPU uh, architecture. So that didn't all happen at exactly the same time, but it was all in kind of that same time frame. And it really gave uh, Intel a kick in the pants uh, right around 2005, 2006. AMD was on top, they were winning. Um, and it wasn't until a good 11 or 12 years later, coming back to this, this year in 2017, that AMD finally actually has sort of come back again when it comes to their CPU game. So I think that's what I would point to. What would we do for a Klondike bar? Uh, what would I do for a Klondike bar? Man, that's an old reference. I used to have, so I'm old, right? I'm, I'm older. So I used to have VHS tapes recorded of movies, you know, they come on. Actually, we had a Betamax too back in the day. And I remember we'd record movies from TV and then they have the commercials in them. And I, that's what the Klondike bar commercial reminds me of. Uh, would you dress up like a clown? That's the one. Yeah, yeah, I would dress up like a clown. That's the only thing I would dress up like a clown for. What is your favorite video you produced this year? And what was your favorite TechTuber video this year? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, this one's from Lenny at uh, Malice Fox on Twitter. And so 
If I'm going purely by revenue, my, uh, my four reasons PC building sucks right now, um, that video took off, lots, got lots of views on that, lots of feedback, so not necessarily my favorite video though. Uh, I kind of go back to the LGA versus PGA video was one that I did this year that I felt like turned out really well, um, so that one was a lot of fun. Uh, the Arctic Panther build series, of course, was a lot of uh, work, but also a lot of fun and actually still ongoing. That's not a single video, so I don't know if I could, I don't know if that counts. And then also what's my favorite tech tuber video this year? Um, also a very good question. I, not a specific video, but I really like the work that Gamers Nexus has been doing this year. They've just really been setting the bar when it comes to the level of testing and validation of different components and that kind of kind of thing. No single video stands out, but um, yeah, I have a lot of respect for the work that Steve and company are doing over there. Uh, and then I would also throw in the Hardware Connects video that they did just kind of recently, um, talking about the vertical GPU mounts on cases. When you put a GPU right here, just doing some practical real world, world testing of a configuration that has gained popularity due to an aesthetic value, but actually tested it and found when you have especially a tempered glass side panel right here up against a vertically mounted GPU that, uh, believe it or not, it blocks a decent amount of the air and your GPU runs hotter and it affects the performance. So I like the practical uh, testing like that and I do feel like it's something that uh, I need to do a little bit more of this coming year. So uh, I'm going to do more of that this year. Thinking about starting a channel, what is something you wish someone would have told you early on? I will mainly do gaming streams and possibly some vlogs. This is uh, Cole Cortez at C underscore Cortez84 uh, on Twitter. And let's see. So you're starting a channel, something. Uh, so the advice that uh, I usually give and that Kyle, I feel like, gives pretty frequently when people ask us about starting a YouTube channel is uh, not to start it with the intent of it being a full-time job or your profession. Uh, to do it because you enjoy making the videos, because you enjoy the content, not necessarily because you want lots of views or you want lots of money. That might come in the future, but you need to start from the right mindset from the beginning. And if that mindset is, I'm gonna make YouTube, I'm gonna make YouTube channel, I'm gonna be famous, I'm gonna make lots of money, I just, I haven't seen many people achieve success because it takes a lot of work several years of work building up a channel from the get-go and you should not be looking at view counts you should be looking at the feedback you get from the people who do watch you should be responding to that you should be updating your contents and adjusting it so that it's still true to what you want to do but also uh, at least has some vague aspiration towards appealing to the people who you want to watch your channel as well and then uh, just remain diligent and just don't have high expectations from the get-go. It takes a long time to get started and get the ball rolling, especially now compared to five or 10 years ago. So uh, yeah, just make sure that you're doing it because you enjoy it and not because, not because of the money. The money comes later. The power and the women. All right, guys, I would like to thank you for bearing with me today since I have really just had some kind of logistical cleanup and packing of stuff to do, uh, but I was happy to answer some of your questions at the same time. Uh, if you missed it, then uh, go ahead and follow me on Twitter at Paul Hardware, and perhaps next time I do a Q&A, you can get a question in there as well. In the meantime, uh, got that H400i build all taken apart and the uh, case back in there. The case actually, I, 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 it was a pretty, pretty nice case, I felt like. It was just the build overall with the various quirks and everything ended up pissing me off. So maybe we'll see that again in the future. And then of course, this is the uh, entry level Threadripper giveaway PC, which I'm picking the winner of today, but it was probably in the past for you guys by the time you see this video. Point is that's all packed up here. And then I got all the retail boxes and the uh, graphics card in this box over there. So whoever the lucky winner is, will get that shipped to them ASAP once they answer their email, of course. But guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video, so hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.